And here we are on filmsgonewild.com. My name is John Wildman, and we are going to talk about the film Echoes of the Empire Beyond Genghis Khan. We have the director, Robert H. Lieberman. The H is important, as I've learned from his previous <laughs> interview. Um, Robert H. Lieberman, the director. Uh, welcome to the show, Robert. Oh, thanks so much. That's, okay. Uh, Wild Man John, I'm, I'm flattered that you're doing this. <laughs> All right, uh, we, we start off the interview um, knowing that likely the people watching this interview have not seen the film as yet. So you get, the first, them. You get the first shot at introducing them to what the film is about. Go ahead. Well, it's like my other earlier films, uh, they call it Myanmar, which was shot in Burma, and Angkor Wakens shot in Cambodia. This is shot in uh, Mongolia. And it's essentially, I'm a novelist and it's a novelist I view of a country. I'm going to take you on a trip, since, especially since you're probably stuck at home, unless you're in Texas or Florida, you're stuck at home. Let me take you on this journey to Mongolia, a place far away, which even if you could travel, you might not go to. It's a rugged place. And it was a hard film to make physically demanding, but uh, I'm taking you on this tour and we've done this. I, and by the way, I'd like to take full credit for this film, but it happened to be a lot of people who helped. You know, it was done the PSP studios in Ithaca, Deborah Horde did the first assembly and then David Cossack, we did the fine editing. We have sound people, you know, animators, uh, artists. So there are many people who were involved in this, drone shooters, a anyhow, uh, it's a sweeping view or novelist eye view of Mongolia. It takes you through the history, but it's not an educational film, so don't get excited. Uh, and it takes you through the history beginning with Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan, as he's known in Mongolia, uh, who had the world's greatest empire. It stretched not just from Mongolia, and Russia and India went all the way to the doorsteps of Vienna, including Hungary, and went all the way to Baghdad. This was the biggest empire the world had ever seen. And Jack Weatherford, New York Times best-selling author of Genghis Khan, The Making of the Modern World, takes us through that period. We will go through the Russian period, uh, and when it was in the 1920s up to 19. Uh, 8990, uh, when it was essentially a Soviet satellite, and up to today, where it's a democracy, and we're going to meet the modern Mongolians. Right. Uh, and not all Mongolians live on the steppe. Uh, you know, not all of them are herders. Right, uh, so right. This is not the kind of, you know, fantasy thing where people, you know, talk about drinking mare's milk and <laughs> you know, and herding sheep, although you're going to see a lot of this gorgeous scenery and animals galore, you know. Uh, you, you know, I have to say, Robert, you know, um, I was describing the film, and of course, we've, you and I have talked about the film. Um, you know, I was describing it to my, my wife after I watched it, and I said, you know, um, which I repeated to you, I think, that, that this film is everything that you had no idea you wanted to know about Mongolia in one film. It is so thorough, and it's so comprehensive, but I think, and this is such an important point, which you kind of touched on a little bit with your, with, with, with as you described it, is that this is not, as I say, a broccoli movie. The, the, you know, the, the, this is, you know, the, you know that, that movie that you go, it's important for me to watch it, but I kind of want to watch the popcorn movie. I'd like something tasty, you know, you know and, and, and so, and it's very important to, to really make sure the audience doesn't think along those lines because there is a richness to this journey, to this trip, as you say, that you take us on. And, and it goes along the lines of, of yes, um, you know, seeing the modern day, see, seeing uh, current day Mongolians, but also giving us that history leading up to, um, showing people on the steppe, but showing people within the city. Um, and one of the things that I would really love for you to talk about, which I found fascinating, um, which I was legitimately educated on, was the idea of the priority that the Mongolian culture put on educating its women. Yes. And, and, and I would love for you to talk about that because I found that fascinating yes. and amazing and wonderful. It's not like 
the West, the women are more educated than the men. And what happens is the mentality is, or in the past was, well, the boys need to be herders. They need to take care of the animals. And they have usually, you know, huge herd. They can have a thousand head of sheep, cattle, horses, combination thereof. Well, the boys have got to take care of the herd. What are you going to do with a girl? Oh, all right, send her to school. So they send them to school and then they go on to the university. And so you have these highly educated women and they have a hard time finding mates of a comparable education. So this is like a, just a reverse situation of, 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 of the Western's past where the men would get educated. You know, I'm at Cornell, I teach at Cornell physics and, and for a long time, Cornell was predominantly male. If you go back to the fifties, certainly. Uh, so this is just a complete reversal where the women are more educated than the men. Although the very top positions in politics are held by men. And one of the people in our film, Oyun, Oyuna, Oyuna, a uh, former MP and minister of culture, uh, who may, I think, run for the presidency. Um, uh, anyhow, she, you know, she's an exception, a, a female politician. But otherwise, you know, in business and everywhere, there are women. Women are running the country in a sense. Right, right. The, the other thing I, I wanted, I want you to talk about because it is, um, and I remember like the first, I think the first, inter, the first email you sent to me, you remarked about, um, you know, how beautiful the film is. And it truly is. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous film. And I would, but, but you know, it takes, great photography to get you to your gorgeous film, regardless of what the subject, whether or not you're shooting on the step, you know, or whether or not you're, you're having those, you know, the, those wonderful bird's eye view of, of the city's architecture and, and it's so incredibly colorful. But talk about filming that, talking about how you achieved that for the film. Well, I, I did not do the drone photography. Michael Roberts, a New Zealander did it. And there's a Mongolian Mugi who did some also. Uh, I was going to pick up uh, a zoo, yeah, pick up a zoo, <laughs> pick up a, uh, a drone and bring it with me to Mongolia to start shooting. And then I talked to a cinematographer friend of mine and he said, don't. Why not? He said, because you're going to be so absorbed in, in the drone, in the operation, in updating the software and learning how to fly it and getting those perfect shots that you're going to drop the whole film. You're gonna lose what you normally do. Stay with what you do and get somebody else to do the drone shots. And that's what I took that advice. And that of course, as a, these guys are just phenomenal drone operators. In Hollywood, there are usually two. You know, there's a guy who's a pilot and then there's the cinematographer. Well, these guys are doing it on their own. And they, it, it looks easy and I've run drones. It's not easy to get a good shot. It's very hard to get a, Beautiful, smooth shot. Um, another technique in this uh, in this film that I used that I started uh, in Burma. In Burma, when I came there in 1980, 80, I'm trying. Oops, can't remember the date. Anyhow, you were not allowed. I was working for the U.S. Embassy as a senior specialist and teaching filmmaking, and you were not allowed to film. And of course, telling me I'm not allowed to film is like you know waving or red flag for a bull. So I decided at that time that I was going to film and I was going to do it myself without the usual crews. And I developed this technique where it's me, the camera and the subject. I take, you know, I shoot, I take the sound, I make the coffee and I use available lighting where possible. And in zero time, people forget the camera. And so we can have these intimate conversations, sometimes highly emotional conversations where the camera is forgotten. And so that's a technique I've used in, you know, and I'm interested in people's psyche. I'm interested in what the hell is going on in their heads. And so all these last three films uh, are really sort of looking at the psychology of the people. I want you to tell me about your country. I want you to tell me about your hopes, your dreams. Uh, I want to know who you are. And I think people reveal themselves through what they say and what they look. Uh, Spengler said, you can see 
the soul of a person through their eyes. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and, and listen, and there's an art um, to documentary filmmaking and also when and how you deliver that information. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, you know, count, we have countless talking head documentaries that, you know, that help us with insomnia, right? Um, you know, and, and, and you never want that. And, uh, you know, you've already given, you, you've given credit, to, it's Deborah Horde. Yeah. You know, you get you know, credit on, on, the, on the editing front, but I would love for you to talk about, um, about the pains that, that, that both of you and, 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 and the other, uh, uh, there's a third editor, I believe you mentioned. David Cossack, yeah. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the pains that the three of you took to, to kind of roll out this information, um, because I think it happens um, quite organically, but it's not organic. It takes a lot of, uh, a, a lot of hours spent shaving a half a second here and half a second there and, and placing the order of one versus the other. Talk about one, um, you know, the, basically the route you took to get there, and two, what your concerns were in delivering it in the right way. Wow. Um, look, as a novelist, you want a hook. You want to grab people by the collar and take them along with you and not let go. And so you cannot, for instance, do the, the history and then do, uh, you know, the Soviet history, you know, Genghis Khan, Soviet history, modern Mongolia. If you do it like that, it's boring. So you have, this thing has to be woven in a kind of way. And I, I mean, my partners, you know, in the production really are, are instrumental. Uh, Deborah, you know, it, it was her idea about the animations, the, the look of them. In, uh, in Encore Awakens, a previous one we used, uh, we used uh, these puppets, uh, these, uh, I want to, shadow puppets to show, you know, to demonstrate. And yeah, I, I don't really know the process. I think Deborah started sort of doing a rough assembly and then we all look, you know, and, you know, what do you think of this? And, you know, should it be over here? Or, you know, what about the order? Am I spending too much time on one thing? I, it's an iterative process. It's really, you know, I'm, I'm terminally ADD. <laughs> and so I don't edit for a good reason, because you can drown. In the, in the Myanmar movie, they call it Myanmar, it was 140 hours. So I, you know, I went to Burma the first time, brought back 40 hours. Deborah saw it the first time we met. Oh, I want to work on this film, she said. It was beautiful. So I went back and I brought him another four. You know, I, I, I began to understand where this film was going. Uh, uh, but it took me four trips ultimately in 140 hours and it's the wealth or the size of the material is, is overpowering well you know uh, but, but again but I, 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 the delivery is really just so well done and you know um you know, you know, I, you know of course you're, you're i overheard you know uh uh Dev Shapiro talking to you about it and, and having watched it a number of times already. And he, he's only had the film for three or four days. So, you know, so, so that, that you cannot get a better, uh, you know, a higher compliment than someone, you know, putting your film on a constant loop because yes, they can't watch it twice. Right? Yes. Um, uh, and, and, and I, I'm right there with Dev on it again. Did, uh, by the way, I just want to know, did he pay twice? <laughs> well, you know, he's a journalist and we never pay. Right. Oh, damn, damn. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Again, <laughs> the film is Echoes of the Empire Beyond Genghis Khan. We've been talking to Robert H. Lieberman, the director of the film, which is screening at the San Luis Obispo International Film Festival. Robert, it's been great talking to you about the film. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry I can't be in California. <laughs> <laughs>